And we're going to talk about Mary of Bethany this morning. You'll find the text there in the seventh verse where we stopped last week. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head and as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Well, those words ring true because here we are two millennia later talking about what Mary did that day in the house of Simon the leper. Well, there's some details I want to give you here and also some uh, uh, adjunct teachings that kind of go along with this. But first, let's talk about what she's doing here. She has an alabaster box that's filled with ointment. Uh, the ointment is uh, nard. It's a spike nard, and it's um, very expensive. It was uh, it come from the east, and uh, from it's uh, grown from a plant in the Himalayas, so it was very costly. Uh, it had to be imported uh, in those days. So it was... Um, it was about a pound of, uh, of this, and that would be a uh, pound or 12 ounces of ointment of uh, spike nard. In John chapter 12, where you get some harmony on this, it says, was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? It could have been, so 300 pence. Now you have to try to add what current value would be. That's very difficult, by the way. And you have uh, all sorts of estimates on this, and the highest of those estimates is $54,500 in current U.S. dollars. Now, that's under, that's under Biden's administration, but it might be different. I mean, there's a lot. Inflation. There isn't any inflation. That's right. What am I talking about? Have you been to the market right recently? You know, I had to get some peanut butter. I was down in East Liberty, and there's Whole Foods down there. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Whole food. Well, they have peanut butter that is freshly ground. So they have this container with peanuts in it. You push a button, and you put a little thing, on, and it grinds it as you're there. You've never tasted peanut butter this good. This is the best peanut butter that you will ever taste in your life. And I don't know what got into me. I, I got a whole pound of it. It's $6 a pound. I mean, I, I, normally, my wife could do that in a heartbeat, but I, I can't spend that kind of money that fast. But I was hungry, and I liked that peanut butter. And uh, so I went and I cashed out there. In fact, I put a little more than a pound in, and I had to give her $7. Hurt even more. Hurt my heart. I no sooner got to the car, I had to eat some of it. I ate half of it. <laughs> At any rate, very expensive ointment. Peanut butter that way. But it was worth it, I'd have to say. So sometimes you, you do things that are a little exorbitant, luxurious. You live a little, right? So I spent $7 on peanut butter, and I'm proud to say I consumed it, and I was happy for the expense, as a matter of fact. Well, this is a lot more expensive than a pound of peanut butter. Perfume's expensive. You ladies know what I'm talking about. Now, for years, they. They use the French title for perfume, which is eau de toilet, <laughs> which means literally water of the toilet. Now, see, right away, you people, you don't know 
The word toilet actually has nothing to do with a commode. That is actually the restroom area is called the toilet. You probably didn't know that, did you? So that's what happens in the English language along the way. So actually water of the toilet meant water that you would use in the rest area where you would use your perfume and so forth. Now you know something, you learn something every time you come here. <laughs> Did you know that there's a, what's called DKNY perfume and it's a million dollars for the perfume. So there you go. A million dollars for eau de toilet? But that's pretty expensive stuff right there. And that's not the only stuff that's out there that's pretty expensive. I, I did a little research on this, right? And uh, my wife's not getting any of this stuff. <laughs> they have some nice stuff at Walmart. But uh, there's a list of what it costs per ounce. You can see very expensive, these compounds that are put together so that a woman can smell beautiful. So there you have it. So uh, perhaps this estimate of $54,000 might not be too far off in current U.S. value as to what that spike nard cost Mary. So there's a little area we need to clean up first here to, um, there are no contradictions in the Bible, but we have two different accounts of um, women anointing, in this case, the head and the feet of Jesus. And uh, one is found in Luke's gospel, and, and she is unnamed, by the way. She is not Mary Magdalene. There's no evidence that it's Mary Magdalene. This is what movies like to do and confuse everybody. But really, the Bible's the best one to go with. So she's called the sinner woman in Luke's gospel, the seventh chapter. And here, she's unnamed in our account. But John tells us her name was Mary. We are in the city of Bethany. So we're very close to Jerusalem. We mentioned this last week as far as the, there's some very interesting studies, uh, topographical, geographical studies about the Holy Land and so forth. There are two cities that are within two, three miles of Jerusalem. Uh, so you might call it a suburb, but I mean two or three miles from the city, the city of God. And one was Bethphage and the other was Bethany. And uh, you would have to have some wealth to live in those places. Those were the, that was high rent district, so to speak. So uh, Mary of Bethany, and uh, it's connected in John's gospel with uh, the 11th, the 12th chapter comes right after the 11th chapter. I know that's a profound truth, but in the 11th chapter, you have Lazarus raised from the dead. That's Mary's brother. And we know that they were having a party because of this. And who wouldn't, right? Somebody's just brought back, Look, people have parties when people die. They call them wakes. Do you know what I'm talking about? And people actually, after somebody has died, they go and have a big party. When I die, I want a lot of tears. We don't need any eating afterwards. Maybe some fasting, right? We want a lot of sorrow at any rate. Imagine if you were raised from the dead. That would be an occasion to celebrate, right? And they did, royally. I mentioned last week the house of Simon, the leper, we, we did our study last week on that, was in uh, propinquity to the house of uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I think they were next door neighbors. And it was a place, so to speak, of refuge for the early church. <laughs> Believers would come there. They were welcomed there, both of these places. And so I'm thinking that even though this happens, our account happens in the house of Simon, the leper, it really wasn't too far away from where Mary and Martha and Lazarus were, and I think it was all in honor. This dinner was in honor. Of course, Jesus was the honored guest. Different than what you have here in Luke chapter 7. So we have these, uh, these accounts all correspond uh, in what we call harmonizing the Gospels uh, and Mark, 20, uh, Mark chapter 14, John chapter 12, along with our text right before us. Now what you're going to notice is that there's a difference in what happens here in Luke chapter 7. You're in the different city altogether, Nain. This is where Jesus had raised uh, the widow's son, as a matter of fact. The, but the, while Jesus is uh, seated there, this woman bursts in and falls at his feet and begins anointing his feet with uh, perfume. This is in what's called Simon the Pharisee's house 
See how confusing this can become. But Simon's a very common name. Uh, it would be like somebody named William, someone named James. You know, so having two people named the same, that, that's not really unusual. Uh, but that's uh, Simon. We have Simon the Pharisee, different than Simon the leper uh, here in our account. So here she pours the ointment and the unction on his feet. Here uh, Mary comes in and pours it on his head and his feet. Two different cases, not the same person. This woman is a sinful woman. Mary is a, a holy woman, a follower of Jesus. Um, here she washes his feet with her tears of repentance. In this case, no washing the feet with tears. We're not talking about repentance in this picture. This picture is a solemn prophecy of what was about to happen to Jesus. She knew it. She was close to the heart of the Lord. Oh, that all of us could be like Mary of Bethany, that we understand the heartbeat of the Almighty God, that we know his will, that we understand the future, that we know what God is going to do, and we are compliant to it. So uh, in both cases, well, here she wipes her feet with her hair. In this case, wiped the feet with her hair as well. So there's similarity, but you can see the difference. And Simon sees the woman as a sinful woman. And in our case, Jesus, uh, Judas sees uh, also this as a waste of money. So two different accounts. Uh, don't get them confused when you're reading them. So that was just something I needed to clear up. OK. Now, what do we find here in this case, Mary of Bethany? Well, what we first see here in our account is that uh, she's a, it's a sacrifice, a, a tremendous sacrifice that she's making, a very expensive one. So in a sense, it would be like um, me pouring out that peanut butter and giving you all a slice of it. And I didn't offer it to you, and you're not getting it from me because there's none left. But in this case, it's a sacrifice. And she's making a very expensive one, as we've noted already. If we have lessons to learn from Mary, beloved, let us be sacrificial Christians. Let us decide to give all that we have, whatever energies, whatever abilities we have, let, let us give it to the Lord and let him be sanctified through us. May the name of Christ be magnified in what we do and what we say and how we live our lives. And let us pour out our life as an, a libation upon the sacrifice of Christ. He made the ultimate sacrifice. All we can do is reasonable service. In Romans 12, the Apostle Paul says, I, well, of course, he's talking about serving the Lord to the Romans, right? And he wants us to uh, sacrifice our lives as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. This, he says, is your reasonable service. So we sacrifice ourselves on a daily basis and give up our will and blend it with his almighty will. We are pouring out the richness of ourselves and whatever we are and all that we are. And we pour it out unsparingly upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you folks, we're willing to do so much sometimes for things that are so trivial. There are folks that are sick sometimes and they say, oh, I can't come to church. I have a pain in my leg. I have this or that and so forth. But, uh, and many have legitimate excuses. But I can tell you what, if, I, uh, if it's a wedding, somebody's invited to a wedding, they would limp to the wedding. They'd drag themselves uh, on their hands if they had to, to get to the wedding. Amen. Our priorities are skewed at times. And we miss serving the Lord. We should pour out our best to him. Oh, we've got other things we can do, no doubt, various activities that we can give ourselves to, but let us pour ourselves out into the sacrifice of his work and be involved in his will. Well, there's other things to learn about Mary. Earlier, we learned uh, in the Gospel of Luke that she was a student of the word. We're going to go through that here in just a bit, but God loves students of the word. I, I, want, uh, I want you guys to be scholars when you leave here. I don't care what your aptitude is. I'm not interested in what your degrees are. Neither is God, by the way. What God is interested in is your heart. If you give him your heart, he will take you wherever you are intellectually, and he will increase your understanding. Uh, you'll become a great student of the word of God. If you know that, 
you, you've got riches untold. Um, of course, she's a worshiper. What do we do? But we find her here falling at the feet of Jesus. Hey, folks, can you picture this? Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We can't see him now. He's separated. We, uh, as Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know. It's going to be all, make all the difference in the world when we, when we slip through this thin veil of uh, terminal life that we have and slip through it into the next world. And it'll take one moment, a final breath. The heart finally beats its last. Immediately your spirit exits your body and you will be in the presence of the Almighty God. I tell you, there's no human syntax that describes this picture. It is indescribable. Wonderful for those who are saved, who are under the blood of Jesus Christ. In fact, it is with great anticipation that all believers look forward to seeing him face to face. The benignant smile of the Almighty upon us, the salubrious effect of God's spirit poured out upon us, healing us, body, soul, and spirit, giving us now an eternal prospect, I tell you, joy unspeakable and full of glory, is how Peter describes it. The psalmist writes at thy, at thy presence uh, is uh, everlasting joy. Thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is going to take us to a place where we'll be totally satisfied. There'll be no disappointments in heaven when you get there. You'll say, well, I thought it was going to be. Well, sometimes we go somewhere. I don't know. Have you ever gone on a trip somewhere? Maybe it cost you money. And uh, you saw the travel logs. You say, oh, it's such a beautiful place. You got there and it rained all night, all day, right? It wasn't what you thought it was going to be. You're a little disappointed. Years back, we went to a restaurant, I remember. It was expensive. I think it was... Was it $12 a person? Something like that. And uh, it was up by Sight and Sound Theater in Lancaster. We went up to see Daniel or some such. Uh, it's really quite an amazing production they had. But there was a restaurant there, and everybody said, oh, you've got to go to this restaurant. And they have roast beef and whatever. And remember this? Cynthia will tell you this story. We went there, and I, we paid more than $12, I think. What was it, 15 it was high priced. Sat down, we were total. I was totally disappointed and they didn't serve you prime rib. They had like scraps of beef that they had scraped off of a dead cow. But um, <laughs> I, <laughs> it was nasty stuff. We were really disappointed. Everybody said, oh, you, oh, you love the food. And so it was terrible. There wasn't a thing that, I mean, the only thing I might have liked was the dessert, I forget. <laughs> We went to a worse place in Denver with my brother, and they said, oh, you're going to love the food there. It's a cafeteria or whatever. And uh, our whole family's there. We still talk about how terrible the food was. <laughs> it was so terrible. Uh, <laughs> we paid a lot for that. At any rate, I digress. Can you imagine when we stand before the Lord, there'll be no disappointments. You're going to say, oh, I thought heaven was going to be. Forget that idea. You know, going to be, oh, what, there's no fishing here? You listen. It's going to be great. But I think we'll first have to fall before him. We'll have to fall down before him. That song, holy, holy, holy. You know, the angels and the cherubim fall down before him. We're going to fall down before him, before anything else. Forget the guided tour and we want to go see this, that, and the other. And so we will see his face. I mean, it's said so chastely, so simply in Revelation, right? And they shall see his face. What will be our reaction? What will be our response? Just, can you imagine such a thing? I don't know what you think of Napoleon. He was a, an apostate for sure. But they asked him once, you know, if, uh, if you were in the presence of uh, the king of uh, England, what would you do? And he said, I'd, I'd stand up and hail the king and so forth. If you were in the presence of this one or that one, what would you do? And, and he said, what if, what if uh, you were in the presence of Jesus? Napoleon said, I'd, 
fall down on my face and cast my crown at his feet. <laughs> he said a wise thing there. We'll do the same at his feet. And we'll worship at his feet. Do you think there'll be some room there for me and for you as we fall down before the... Well, Mary was practicing, wasn't she? She knew who he was. You know, when Jesus came, he took this finite beaker of a human body. Before that, he was the Logos. He was non-corporeal. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. But then the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. Hebrews says he had to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. But to come in such a humble way, didn't come regally, didn't come with trumpets blaring, he didn't come with an entourage, he came like a poor man, dressed in rags as it were, and he came to the situation of humanity. He identified with all of us. And so you had to see who he was beyond the exterior. That's why Jesus queried the apostles there in the 16th, where he said, whom do men say that I am? Oh, you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said, but whom do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, yes, you're blessed for what you said today because you could see beyond the external. Mary could see beyond the external. She knew who he was. And somehow she understood that when he spoke earlier about being crucified, and rising the third day, he was giving the prophecy, but only Mary seemed to understand what that meant. And at his feet, she bows. Mary of Bethany, what an illustration. What an example for all of us. There are a number of Marys. We know of the Virgin Mary, right? The mother of Jesus. We know there's another Mary that's the, uh, the, an aunt to the Sons of Thunder. There's another Mary called Mary Magdalene, sometimes assumed to be a, pro a prostitute. She's no prostitute. She's a wealthy woman. She had seven devils. So she was uh, dabbling in the occult, apparently. Um, and now we have this Mary. So that was a very common name. And Mary of Bethany, different Mary than all the other ones. But what a lesson she teaches us. And of course, Mary the discerner, we'd have to say. Well, what does this mean? She understood what was coming next. I mentioned that Mary was a student, and, and you know the account, I think you know the account in Luke chapter 10, a very famous account. And uh, sometimes I, I like to find out who I'm preaching. How many of you were first born? You were the first born in your family. See, they don't want to put their hands up. But. Because everybody hates us. How many of you were middle children like me? Forgotten. And, okay. And who were the babies here? Now these babies, okay, we all understand how this works. The firstborn is favored, but also receives a lot of responsibility. They have to be the example. They sometimes have to change the diapers of the younger ones. They have to do a lot. They have to do with some of the cleaning they, uh, and so forth. But they also have rich advantages because they were the firstborn and they're the primary. They're viewed as the head and so forth. And sometimes they're disciplined a little harder than the others. That's the way it works and so on. But not, not in my family. It didn't work that way. I was the third born and I got the worst discipline. At any rate, <laughs> middle children. Well, I think Martha was the firstborn. There's nothing in the scripture that tells me this. I'm assuming that. I can tell by her attitude. She she's, takes charge. Uh, leaders, she's a leader. This is what the firstborn is. And they take charge. And they're, they're problem solvers. They're hard workers, usually, right? So I, I see Martha as that. They're also complainers. So. No offense to any of you that are firstborn. It's just the truth, and you know it. <laughs> so now it came to pass. As they went, that they entered into a certain village. Now we know that that village was Bethany. And a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. 
it, it seems to me, look, why is it called Lazarus' house? But it's called her house. So I think she's the head here. And then uh, she had a sister named Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet. So this seemed to be where you'd find Mary, no matter what, when Jesus would come to visit. I think he visited often because they needed a place to stay. He was peripatetic. You've got a dictionary. So Jesus went from place to place, didn't he? And as he went from place to place, peripatetic, he went to these different places. He needed a place to stay. A man once said, Jesus, where do you live? He said, well, the foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. He needed a place to stay. And Jerusalem, there weren't many places to stay. It was the, a major mega city, right, capital. So the house, the door was always open to the house of Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. She had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word, a student. Sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his word. Now, some of you are just new to church or you just started coming to church or whatever. Do you have a Bible? If you don't, let me know. I'm going to get you a Bible. I'm going to get you the best Bible available, King James Version. And uh, we want you to read your Bibles. We want you to bring your Bible to church. How many of you brought your Bible to church here, huh? You have your Bible with you? Right here? Look, people holding their cell phones up. <laughs> well, some people, that's where their Bible is, right? Or an iPad. You brought your Bible, a good thing, right? And follow along. You want to make sure whoever that guy in the pulpit is, he's taking it from the Word. Yeah, Better read from the Bible. We don't need everybody's opinion, frankly. We need what God has to say. Don't get mad at the preacher when I say this is a sin and that's a sin. Get mad at God. He's the one that wrote it, and I prove it. I'll show you. This is what he said. Now it's on you after that. It's between you and God. People would rather get mad at the preacher. Listen, that's, that's uh, really, that's puerile. It's childish. Why would you want to? Preachers, if he's telling you the truth that's in the Bible, he's your best friend you ever had. Best friend you ever had. I'm trying to do all I can to promote my image at this point. I'm your best friend. Don't get mad at him. That's a mistake. All right. So, there's some things I have to get off my chest at times. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. What's wrong with that? Much serving. Nothing wrong with that. You know, I hate that term, workaholic. People say it like it's a... A terrible thing. He's a workaholic. He works too hard. Do you know what your grandfather did? How he worked? you have any idea how they worked? Those that came from the old country and came over here couldn't speak English. Huh? You know, they'd work 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week. Some of them had to take second jobs, as a matter of fact, because, you know, Carnegie wouldn't pay you much down in the mills, I can tell you. So, so they had to do, they had to take other work. And, so, and we complain because, you know, we have eight-hour days and half of which are spent with people just sitting around talking to each other or on their cell phones. And so I'm, I'm sorry, we don't work as hard as we used to. So if somebody actually does work and seems to work with a great amount of alacrity, you know, and puts everything into what they're doing, uh, they say, workaholic. That's not good. That's not healthy, you know. I'll tell you what's not healthy. Being a sloth sitting around doing nothing, twiddling our thumbs and so forth. One amen came up from that. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> and it was a firstborn. Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she come and help me. Well, well, Martha wanted to be there, too. And she wanted to sit and listen to the teaching. And uh, serving is wonderful. But there's a time for sitting and listening to God and hearing him. More important than serving. In fact, you really can't serve well if you don't do this first. Amen. So, but now she's saying, look, hey, I'm doing all the work. And the baby sits here and gets pampered. And that's what happens to the last 
child, they get pampered. Everybody does for them, and the whole world surrounds them. And, and to them, it's all about what you're going to do for me next. Amen. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> Who said amen? Another firstborn. <laughs> Middle children are saying amen. Everybody but the last said, no, I'm not spoiled. Okay. Jesus answered and said, Martha, Martha. Why two Marthas? When Jesus has to say your name the second time, you're not listening. Martha. You probably start off Martha and then Martha because she's going on. You don't understand what it's like. I'm back here by myself. I got to wash these pots. And stuff. Martha, you know, listen to me. Thou art careful. Careful? Well, full of care. That's what it means. You know, you're, you're full of care about wrong things. You're careful and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Get your mind on things eternal. Mary's chosen the good thing, right? One thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. There was a great lesson in that, Mary of Bethany. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and soaked in the word of God. I don't know. Was she just trying to get out of work? I don't think so. She loved the Lord, and she loved to hear him teach. What did Jesus have to tell me today? What lesson can I learn? How can I be a better Christian? So, you know, this is all about what I consider to be the gift of helps, help. She pours out what she has. She believes that she's helping Jesus. Jesus acknowledges that. Now here we find that she pours it on his head and it drips down to his feet. So we understand it's a, it's, there's an Old Testament uh, picture in the Psalms of uh, the blessedness of the priest that is anointed with oil and it runs down his beard onto his garments. Jesus is stepping out of the role of a prophet and he's now about to be a priest. This is, uh, we call it the Munis Triplex. Uh, we always like to introduce some Latin for Catholics here. So the Munis Triplex is the threefold office of Christ. The prophet, the priest, and the king. He came here as a prophet to teach and to heal and to do good, good works. And that's why when he was born, they brought three gifts, didn't they? One was the gift for the prophet, the myrrh. One was given as a gift to a priest, the frankincense, and one a gift to the king, the gold. And so Jesus is stepping out of the role of a prophet, and now Mary understands he's about to enter the priesthood. He's about to give himself as a sacrifice on the cross. She anoints his head, and it drips down his beard, onto his garments, onto his feet is fully anointed with the Holy Spirit and about to give up his life for the rest of us. She understands that. She heard his word and she didn't just hear it, she discerned its meaning. One thing to hear, quite another thing to understand, folks. When you're reading your Bible, you can say, Lord, help me to read it, but also help me to understand it. I need to know what it means. So, she's helping Jesus. Jesus said, she's doing this because she's going to anoint my body for a burial that's going to be taking place here very shortly. It's a gift. Romans calls it the gift of helps. People like to uh, speak of the temporal gifts, you know, the gift of healing, the gift of tongues, the gift of prophecy, uh, foretelling the future, and so on. But those were temporal gifts. There were gifts that were meant to endure, gifts that would be constantly used through the millennia of the church age. And Romans gives us that gift, and those gifts, one of which is the gift of helps. What's the gift of helps? It's helping. 
It's being there for somebody. It's viewing that there's a weakness and there's a need and a necessity and saying, I've come here to meet the need in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's ample illustrations of this gift of helps. Uh, Moses, is, he has his hands up stretched before God, right? And he's praying for victory. And uh, as he's praying for victory, his arms are getting tired. Hey, you know, I think I, I relate, 80 years old, right? And down, his arms start down like this. And, uh, and Aaron and her come. And they realize when the arms go down and there's no prayer being offered, the children of Israel are losing the battle in the valley. And so they come and they support his arms. They're holding them on either side. They learned the gift of helps. And to be alongside, in this case, the intercessor, Moses. Um, Moses also had a father-in-law, didn't he? He gave him advice and said, you can't, you're, you're going to burn out. <laughs> and uh, he gave him all this advice about, you've got to get some people, divide up the people, get some leaders there, uh, 70 elders, and let them help you in the councils. Uh, that need to be done. Gift of helps, that's all. Let them judge the people like you're judging them. Uh, let the Spirit of God come on them as he's on you. And gave him that advice. It was, uh, it was uh, sage advice. Aquila and Priscilla are found as agents of help to the Apostle Paul. Uh, they are exiled Jews. They've been thrown out of Rome because Claudius hates the Jews. And, uh, and so he, he bans them from the eternal city of Rome. And so... Uh, Paul uh, finds them, and they're great helpers. He calls them uh, my helpers in Christ Jesus, right, in Romans 16, 3. And uh, they helped him along, gave him a lodging, and said, look, uh, we're tent makers. And he was a tent maker. He said, we can earn our living this way while you're preaching the gospel. There's this uh, woman, she's called Dorcas, or Ta Tabitha. She's got, she's got an ability of sewing. Um, she puts, puts together these these clothes, there's, there's poor widows, and they're cold in the wintertime. And she says, I, here's a coat for you. And they say, well, we, we have no money. And she said, this is the, a gift, my talent used, and gift used in the name of Jesus Christ. She, was, she had the gift of helps. It was Job that knew that uh, his friends were here to prosecute him and persecute him. And they called him a hypocrite and a phony and irreligious. And he said, no, no, no. He said. Just the opposite. I, I've, I've been there. I've delivered the poor when they cried and the fatherless. And him that had none to help him, I was by their side. I was a helper. Uh, those that were ready to die, to perish, uh, came upon me. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. He said, I was uh, eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. And on he goes, delineates a list of those good things he did in the name of Almighty God. Now, my friends, listen, good works cannot take you to heaven. We're not good enough. But good works follow those that follow Jesus. Jesus fills us with a new spirit. It's not self-centered anymore. It's not what's for me in this. When you become a Christian, it's about others. It's about living like Jesus lived for others. He fills our heart with the attitude, what, what can I do in the name of Christ to make another person's life a bit easier, to ameliorate the suffering of someone who is in great and grave danger and need. That's what this is all about. <laughs> well, yesterday we had to get cement. 30 bags, I said. We'll need to get 30 bags. So we took that church truck over. I had my helper with me, Bob Pampina. Bob is almost as old as I am. How old are you, Bob? 60-something? 65? Nine. Nine? I didn't know you were that old. <laughs> So here we are, right, two 70-year-old guys going for 30 bags of cement. How many of you ever lifted a bag of cement? Yeah. Not a single baby born put their hand up. It was all the firstborns. Okay. So, I mean, they're reasonably heavy. They're not possible to lift. But 30 bags is a pretty good deal. So we went inside there and uh, go back to Home Depot. It's on the right. I can tell you where everything is at Home Depot. And it's on the right, about halfway down the aisle, and there's the sack creek. Pulling it out, putting it on, and handing it to Bob. Bob is helping now and then, I mean. And uh, we were working pretty hard there. Young guy comes up to us and says, you, you guys need help. 
And that was, wasn't that a beautiful thought? He's a young guy. I, I saw his name tag. It was Josh. And I said, you know, yeah, yeah, we do need him. He said, well, we have these outside on pallets. You can pull your truck right up to it. It can load right off the truck instead of putting it in here and taking it up to the front. I'm waiting for him to, to come with us to <laughs> unload the pallet. No, that was, that was his help. <laughs> was it. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. <laughs> he could see we were older gentlemen. <laughs> the gift of helps. Not everybody has. He thought he helped that day. Let me give you a little advice. You know, pull your truck up over here. <laughs> Certain women which Jesus had healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, but there were others with her. They must have had seances. Who knows what they were doing, playing around with the devil's crowd. And uh, Jesus healed them, cast the devil out of them. I mean, that's an invaluable thing. Talk about a helper. Jesus was the greatest helper of all. He was called the healer of the breach and repairer of ways to dwell in. And he helped these women cast the devil out of their lives. He did that for me. How about you? Cast the devil out of your life. And now what is your reasonable service but to give your life to him, right? Follow him. <laughs> and they did. These certain women, they, they had means. They were wealthy women. And they... Uh, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, was Herod's uh, steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. They helped. Now, you know, Jesus owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If he, if he was hungry, he didn't have to tell anybody. I mean, he could, we know what he could do, right? Peter said, they want us to pay taxes. What are we supposed to do? You know, taxes. And uh, he said, well, go down to the... To the First, put your hook in there. You're a fisherman. The first fish that comes up, you'll find a gold coin in his mouth. Go, go pay the taxes, right? Imagine that. People say, what kind of a fish was it? It had to be a goldfish. But at any rate, think, go pay it. He didn't need them to do this. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. But he deigns to use us. Isn't that something? He said, I, I need your help. I need your help. I need you to spread the good news and tell people the truth. Imagine him using people like us. Once served the devil, now serving Christ. Certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary among them, she had seven devils in her. Joanna, the wife of Cusa. Well, now this, these are people that have high authority. Susanna, oh, Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Well, we think of the, this great illustration. Here's a man quadriplegic. Can't move his arms, can't move his legs. There's no wheelchairs, no access vehicles, no, no. He's really completely at the, uh, at the mercy of his friends. What friends they were, though. The four heard Jesus is preaching at the house of Peter. Jesus could do miraculous things. We saw him do it. He can help our friend. And so these four said, we're going to bring him to Jesus. What a friend. These four were. But they got there, and as it was standing in room only, wasn't it? You think somebody's going to give up their seat? Here's a man on a cot. It takes four to bring him. And so they, they said, we can't get in the house. It's standing room only. We've got to get him. We want him right in front of Jesus. If Jesus sees him, he's going to be healed. So uh, they could have said, well, we tried. We did our best. That's all. No, no, no. They weren't to be denied. And they found in those houses in those days had steps that went up to the rooftop. And oftentimes, they would go up to the rooftop. Uh, the roof, of course, was nothing more than some branches across and uh, mud and so forth. And that was all it was. So they went up to the rooftop. 
And I can just see these four now. Can you imagine getting a guy up on a cot? Four people taking him up. This was no easy enterprise, but they were not to be denied what friends they were and what a gift of helps it was. And finally, they got up uh, to the rooftop. And I'm imagining one of them there, the leader of the group, firstborn. And he, he, he probably listening. He's listening. He can he hear the voice of Jesus. Oh, it's over here. He's over here. Come on, bring him over here. And they brought him over. And then they start digging away and digging away. And all of a sudden, here's Jesus teaching. All of a sudden, there's a, a skylight, a light, shaft of light coming down. What a dramatic scene it was. All this dirt coming down and so on. And then there they have him. And it had to be a big hole to get a cot through, OK? And they dig the hole through. Jesus is watching it curiously. I think a smile crosses his face, ever so slight. He loves what he's seeing here. He knows what this is about. He knows what they're doing. And then they lower him lovingly down with those ropes. And I view it as Jesus, you know, he, they bring it down lower and lower, and they just leave it just kind of juxtaposed between the roof and the ground. And just for a moment, and Jesus sees it. And there are the four looking down, and Jesus looks up at them, and I think they're smiling down below, right? He sees their faith. And he says to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven thee. <laughs> That's not quite what they thought he was going to do. In fact, they weren't sure that Jesus could say such a thing. They knew he was a great prophet. Did they know he was God? Only God can forgive sins. And the murmuring started in the crowd. There must have been some Pharisees there that said, who can forgive sins but God? They were right. They just didn't know who he was. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Well, that would have been enough right there. We all have afflictions, don't we? Everybody have a problem here? Can I go around the room? Hear everybody's problems, right? Oh, man, it would take, yeah, but it would take hours and hours, everybody. I don't ask people how they are anymore. I know where we're going with that. That's it. We all have problems. If Jesus says to you today, your sins are forgiven you, your biggest problem has just been solved. If you don't get another answer to your prayers, that Jesus said to you, your sins have been forgiven you, that's enough. Because we all have a long list of sin, folks. And those sins will send you right down to hell. I'm telling you, without Christ, you'll burn forever. You think you've got pain now. But Jesus said to that paralytic, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> I'm wondering if that paralytic who couldn't move a muscle in his body, but perhaps could only move his lips, if he smiled slightly and said, thank you, Lord, that's enough. But Jesus said, but to prove that I have the authority, it's no great thing for me now to say to you, Take up your bed and walk. And so he did. And I don't know how you think he walked. What do you think when he got up out of that cot for the first time and strength came to his legs again? And it, these crippled up hands and arms suddenly had life. And a body that was once nearly rigor mortis could now flex. And it was, his ne neck could animate. And, and I think. And when he got up, he started leaping and jumping and dancing and shouting for joy. Oh, it was a happy scene. It had to be. The gift of helps. <laughs> this long introduction, we haven't gotten to the message yet. That's why we have service at night, part two. It's Epaphroditus. You say, we don't know what to call our son. Try this. <laughs> Epaphroditus. Well, you know, Paul writes to the Philippians, they had sent Epaphroditus on a mission of mercy. If you have a map in your Bible, you will see where he came from, Philippi, and he had to get to Rome. If he did it cross country, that's a big distance. 
difficult roads, uh, inclement weather. He had to sacrifice to do it, but he willingly sacrificed to minister to the man that brought Christ to his heart. And uh, he risked his own life, but he came to bring the necessities that Paul had, uh, the things that Paul wanted and needed. He said, make sure you bring the parchments. Bring the scrolls, but bring the parchments. Bring my study books and bring the word of God to me. I need it in prison here. And uh, so he's bringing all that and no doubt brought other necessities with him. You're in jail. Boy, what, I preached out the jail and I mean, you know what they would serve down there? I mean, right, Jim? Yeah. Jim, right? That would, food. Every once in a while the guys say, why don't you stay for lunch? I said, that's okay, I'm not hungry. I mean, when you look at a plate and the meat is still moving, I'm not, I don't want that. And uh, imagine, he, I think Epaphroditus brought food with him too. Or maybe stopped at the local uh, Agora before he got to the Roman <laughs> you know, prison and bought, I know what he got, fresh peanut butter. <laughs> it's, can you imagine the apostles? Oh man, that had to taste good. So, <laughs> so he, brought, he brought all this because he was a helper, a helper. That's all we know about him. He risked his life to help. What a great helper he was. Well, we have to move on with the narrative. And we're introduced to a detail that is left out in Matthew's gospel. But John tells you the detail. So here's this woman pouring out all that she has of this very expensive spike nard, pouring it out, wiping the feet of Jesus. And while this is all going and the unction, the odor fills the room, this woman who has given uxorious love to her master is now being criticized. Judas is carping about this. One of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, uh, which should betray him. John lets you know. Right? Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Uh, so while others are looking in amazement at the love and sacrifice of this woman, Judas is here to criticize him. And John tells you what the motive is. He held the bag. He was the treasurer. And no doubt took money out of that treasury every once in a while. Greed was his problem. And it would finally lead to his damnation. Then he said not the, that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. So John knew he was taking money out of the bag. Took money out of the bag. No doubt when Peter said, we've got to pay taxes, and they went, the bag's empty. They went to the treasurer. What happened? Where'd all the money go? Well, we, you know, we had hotel bills. Well, I don't know what he, whatever he did, he lied about it. He was a thief. And he had the bag, and he bare that which was within. So we begin to understand something about his nature. This act that ultimately leads to perfidity. He is a traitor of the worst kind. Now you move in your text here to the 14th verse and you're gonna find then one of the 12, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, what will ye give me and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now you see why I gave you that little insert of John chapter 12? Because John goes beyond the narrative and he actually probes the motives of what was going on in that room. It was Judas that was complaining about the pouring out of the spike nard. The reason he did is because he was a thief. John says it wasn't because he cared for the poor. John knew who he was. And he indicts him here. And also in the text, it goes well before it, it says and he would be the one to betray Jesus. Now Jesus hasn't said it yet, but he will shortly. 
So they covenanted. He goes running to the priests and the Pharisees. And uh, he said, what would you give me if I told you where Jesus was? You're trying to find him, aren't you? And he, uh, he, he lives in the hills, but nobody knows. They can't keep up with him. I know where he is because I'm part of the secret coterie. I'll tell you where he is if you give me the right price. 30 pieces of silver. See how sad it is. Your Bible is an interesting book. 500 years before this account. Zechariah, in his prophecy in the 11th chapter, says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price. If not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. 500 years before Judas goes to betray Jesus. And yet they do exactly what Zechariah prophesied they would do. They gave him the exact amount. There's no book like this book, folks. This book that you said you carried to church today, it's an amazing book. And so 500 years before, it's prophesied. And it happens just the way it was to happen. Now, um, I'm sorry, but we're at the end of the church service. Doesn't that go fast? It's all, it's over already. And at the door, you'll say, I could have stayed all day. Well, I'll meet you tonight at 6.30 then. So let's pray. Lord, there's something to learn from every line in the scripture. And all I could do here is uncover a few thoughts. Meager at the best. But still profitable for those that are listening. Like Mary, Lord, we want to be students. We want to be at the feet of Jesus and soak in every word, Lord. What can you teach us? What can you give to us, Lord? You've already given us eternal life, but now we want to know more. Like that songwriter that said, more, more about Jesus. So teach us your way, and teach us your word, and give us, Lord, satisfy our thirst for knowledge in the eternal. Now, Lord, if there's anyone in this room not committed to you, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They might say that they believe, but I'm talking about knowing you receiving you as Savior. My friends, have you done that? Have you opened your heart to Jesus? Judas would have said he believed in Jesus. He walked with him. He certainly believed in him, but he did not believe on him. He wasn't trusting him. It appeared as though he was following Jesus, but he really wasn't at all. It was all about the world to him. It was all about gain to him. So my friends, Ask yourself the question, do I really know the Lord or am I depending on something that happened when I was just a kid and I was baptized or I went to a camp, summer camp and went forward when I was eight? I'm hoping that you're depending on a true knowledge, that you know the Lord, you know that you've been redeemed, you even know how it all happened, and what Christ did in taking sin out of your life. And there's evidence that you serve him and love him that your life isn't about yourself i hope that's the case for everyone in this room how would i know i can't look in your heart so i instruct you today to believe on the lord jesus christ i instruct you to give your heart to him today and i would invite you to do that right now as we all stand together just for a moment please and quietly we're standing before the lord and i want you if you're not saved to leave your place and just come up here to the front and kneel down and somebody's going to come and pray with you right now. You're coming to say, I want to receive the Lord. I, I'm hearing the word and I want to be like Mary. I one day want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want my sins to be forgiven. And so I invite you to come and kneel down and say, yes, Lord, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Take me to heaven when I die. And as believers here, you know all of us can have the gift of helps, right? You might not have the gift of uh, preaching or the gift of teaching or the gift of singing or the gift of music of some kind or gift of poetry. But all of us can have the gift of helps, can't we? We can be helpers. We can do what we can do. So let us pour it out. 
Let us pour our lives out in service to the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now dismiss us with power and blessing today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come into